I want to compliment Murat for his um, leadership in organizing this conference when he invited me to speak at the first of these four years ago. Uh, and in each conference since, the, the, the rationale has been uh, how does computing learn from brain circuitry to go beyond the von Neumann paradigm, to go beyond the capabilities of, 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 um, of computing that we've, uh, we've, we've seen become limited uh, by physical limits and draw from brain circuitry to go far beyond that, both in power consumption capabilities as well as in computational capabilities. You know, look at a hummingbird function. What's the size of that circuitry and the power? And look, look at what a hummingbird does. Uh, I, don't think a, I don't think a convolutional net, even though Amir's spectacular talk and what his company is doing is just um, going to be uh, breaking the back of so many commercial problems. Uh, and, and there's many, many years of runway that, that they and, and their competitors have. I don't think that they're on, on the, the path of making a sensory motor system like any of, any of those that are in nature. Um, so th the charge of this meeting and its goal is to draw from neural biological systems to extract, uh, as, as the meeting's title uh, refers to, neurally inspired computing elements. And so for that, what I wanted to use this talk for, because it's fairly short and, and because I think it, uh, uh, it, it, gets, it gets lost in the, uh, in the success of deep convolutional nets, I wanted to put into context the history and the way forward and the point that we are in that history now. Um, uh, from the 40s with McCulloch and Pitts and classical AI to the more neural systems that Rosenblatt and actually Turing introduced, believe it or not, uh, Alan Turing, 1948, this is an un, uh, not widely published uh, manuscript that he submitted uh, to the British, uh, some unit of the British Army, where he first conceived of what is on the left neural nets. Uh, Rosenblatt's perceptron is much more familiar in the late 50s. Uh, Minsky and Peppard killed that, uh, but it got resurrected by Hopfield, as we all know, in the 80s. And in the 80s, in fact, in 1980, uh, a fellow named Fukushima, how many people have heard of the neocognitron? Pretty good chunk, maybe 25, 30% of the audience. So in 1980, Fukushima published one of several uh, lucid papers developing a system he called the neocognitron, which has been made famous and extended greatly by Jeff Hinton and, and other uh, colleagues of his uh, 30 years later. And that's, uh, that's the convolutional net, which um, there's the biological cybernetics 1980 landmark paper and here's the system, and if you look at it, you'll recognize a convolutional net. It, inter it, it, it uh, interchanges sensory feature layers with pooling layers, like simple cells and complex cells, and it uh, iterates that in a deeper and deeper hierarchy. You can see it's convolutional on the, on the top panel, in, in, in the sense that, 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 that the, the word convolutional implies. <clears throat> and. Um, that's now been extended by our friends at Google and other places. Mm -hmm. You know, uh, if any of you have visited Google, there's just such a fabulous, let's go do it, spirit about that place. And here they've just gone and done it with, you know, now 25, 30 uh, layer convolutional network. The, the convolutional feed forward layers uh, uh, are in blue, the pooling layers are in green. Uh, Softmax is a, a form of uh, soft winner take all, of course, and they've just, uh, as, as Tom Dean of, of Google says, this is just uh, the neocognitron and, and the 1980s distributed processing, but it's just done right, done with a vengeance, scaled up. And here we, we Amir, where's Amir? There's Amir back there. Amir has just brought us the, uh, you know, the current instantiation of this being applied to 25 different technical problems. Uh, Chris Baskar will tell us about the 26th technical problem that it can be applied to uh, this afternoon. Uh, one thing that this audience should be aware of, even though it's good and bad, is that the power of that simple paradigm of deep convolutional nets 
wrenched into extraordinarily high performance applications by Google, by Nirvana, by, by others. That's, that's going to bring value to solving a lot of real world problems. And we've got to be careful that it doesn't suck all the oxygen out of the underlying, because it is going to be working so successfully, out of the underlying intellectual uh, opportunity, which is to draw from brain circuitry. You know, Christoph uh, showed us all the extraordinary depth and complexity of real neural circuitry. Uh, he's got 310 people hard at work every day um, unraveling it. So how do we bridge that gap? Uh, how do we draw from neural circuitry without getting lost in, in, you know, in 10 miles of detail and yet not satisfy yourself with the real simplicity of convolutional nets. And again, they, they can do great things, not only separate, identify separately cats and dogs, but even recently, profound capabilities that you might consider action selection in a complex environment, which is playing Go. I mean, I think this is really a, something to be reckoned with, this, this paper that came out uh, about five weeks ago that I'm sure most of us have have heard about or read, which, uh, which takes convolutional nets and beautifully extends them. I mean, even a simple paradigm can be extended not only to 30 layers, but can be extended in, uh, in concept. So here, I won't go through that paper. Many of you have read it. But they take 13-layer uh, nets, one for action selection, first trained with supervised learning, and then retrained with reinforcement learning. They have a separate net called a value network that uh, uh, learns the, the, the likelihood of a win from, from any given position. And then they just drive this with training and extension. And uh, six weeks ago, they beat in the game of Go, they beat the European champion. Uh, so that, that's, you know, that, that's, that, that's going to take neural computation and define it uh, for the next 10 years and, you know, fair part of our careers, if, if some of us don't try to point to, define, and prove the value, the capability of pursuing real neural computation, you, you know, which in, in, uh, in many ways is different. So let, let me try to go back to the title of this conference, Neurally Inspired Computing Elements. And let me, what I really wanted to do with the rest of my talk is to define what neurally inspired computing elements, computing elements are. Here is the computing element of the Google ImageNet or uh, the DeepMind Nets. This is a, a thresholded, uh, a thresholded uh, or sigmoid output uh, conversion of weighted inputs um, to a uh, nonlinear output function. It's essentially a single node. There are other operations, including the softmax and, and perhaps other normalizations that are available. But on the right, if that's the unit on the left in a, in a cartoon schematic, on the right, as Christoph has, has teams studying night and day, on the right is a model of that thick trunk layer 5B neuron that, that Christoph mentioned. So what, what does it look like? If we're doing the reverse engineering of a Pentium, uh, you know, from another planet, we get a sample of a Pentium, what are we going to do? Well, we're going to do the, we're going to understand transistors and how they work and then how they can be combined. So what I'm going to, what, what I'm going to point out is, is that these five characteristics of neural circuits and their components, uh, those are universal. They're not just found in some, some particular application in some particular species for some particular sensory motor purpose. Every one of these five has evolved and is present in every neuron in the cortex of the brain of not only all of us, but of every creature and um, uh, is uh, used for every function. So these, these are universal computing mechanisms that are, that are um, ubiquitous. And we should at least be thoroughly familiar with them as we think about neurally computing, neurally inspired computing um, and, it, and, and its development. So neurons are, uh, branched structures, they're not, they're not properly thought of as single points. Those branches are nonlinear. They're, they integrate inputs in ways that are not simply summing and firing, but much, much, much richer than that. 
in ways that, that we could spend hours talking about. Those local events not only amplify or suppress combinations of, of, of temporally coordinated input, but they also gate wiring. But the inputs that we're talking about, uh, those inputs, the inputs in, in, in Google ImageNet uh, are, 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 are multiplicative weights, and that's why uh, Nirvana needs to have a, a mul matrix multiplication uh, uh, accelerated so importantly. Well, real synapses are, 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 are very different. Uh, real synapses are probabilistic in their transmission, and that probability dynamically changes on the 10 millisecond, 50 millisecond, 100 millisecond level as a function of patterns of input. So they're temporal pattern filters. And that function, as I'll show at the end of the talk, that function, that, that capability, that the dynamic changing of probability of transmission is central for their function. And it's different in every connection type, and it's present in every single synapse in your brain. That, na that nature of that transmission, that it's probabilistic and that the probability itself changes. So how can we possibly conceive of neurally inspired computing that doesn't incorporate it systematically? Uh, all of these elements, the dendritic excitability that's nonlinear, the degree of excitability, synaptic transmission probability, all of them are locally homeostatically modulated. This is a universal, ubiquitous characteristic. It's necessary for the function. It wouldn't be universal if it weren't necessary for the function of biologically evolved neural computation. And lastly, as I was bringing up with Christoph towards the end of his, in, during the questions, these circuits, it's self-evident, but it's important to say these circuits wire themselves. They wire themselves during development prenatally. They then wire themselves further during sensory motor experience. That self-organization of wiring is pivotal to the function of neural circuitry. It's not just weight modifications. It's wiring changes. It's not just supervised wiring changes that are imposed as in the go net by stochastic gradient descent, sort of a global function. That's not biological, physical. That's not local. But those, the, the wiring of the circuits themselves self-organize uh, during sensory experience. So how does that happen? We need to know that in order to build and synthesize neural circuits that would go into the future generation of machines. And, and since I think Google Net and convolutional nets are going to occupy everybody for the next 10 years outside this room, we're going to have to wait 20 years for those truly neural machines. But let's at least know what real neural elements look like. So this is that layer 5 neuron. Here I'm just injecting current into the cell body. You can see that it's a complex system that propagates information. That, the, the voltage is coded in color, of course, and uh, that propagation of information allows the fact that the cell fired to be communicated to uh, the distant reaches of the cell, per, for example, to gate what's called, the, everyone knows what Hebbian plasticity is, the conjunction of input and postsynaptic spiking. Well, you have to convey the information that the postsynaptic cell spiked, and so that back propagation is found in every neuron in the cortex. All those 42 different types that, that Christoph has. Have you found any where there's no back propagation? Probably. Yeah. So, so we found them in, in reptile cortex. It's not just humans, it's not just mammalian. Okay, so that's not how input comes in. That's how input comes in in some uh, physiology experiments. But really, in com input comes in via synapses. So here you've got input coming into the branches. It doesn't come into the cell body. Input comes into the branches, excitatory input. <clears throat> but here what you see is the complexity of electrical events in the branches. This is what happens in the neurons in biological circuits. Synaptic input comes into the branches. Those branches nonlinearly combine the inputs, <clears throat> and they produce events sometimes localized to the branches <clears throat> that contribute to firing the cell, but also gate changes in the branches, gate wiring changes, gate synaptic weight changes. <clears throat> so, so right now, wow, right now we're looking at a computational unit. That's the transistor, if, or the, that's the sort of s structure that called the neuron. You know, it takes 3,000 differential equations to simulate such a neuron at a intermediate level of, of, of accuracy. 
you can just imagine the functional space, the function of functions of the way that such a neuron integrates spatiotemporal patterns of input. But those are the computational units in biological circuits. Now, as Christoph pointed out, I think I saw this, this image in one of his slides. This is from our mutual friend, Alex Thompson. This is just the excitatory cells. The, the, uh, what I'll just say to echo what Christoph, Christoph said is that the, the integrative characteristics of each of these different cell types, the 42 that he's identified, they're all different. They have different flavors, different, they produce different spike output patterns in response to different patterns of spatiotemporal input. But here's one thing I, I really want to get across because it's, it's surely not integrated into any aspect of convolutional nets. <coughs> Perhaps one day it will be. <coughs> and that is the nature of the synapses, the nature of the connection. So this is a, as everyone probably knows, most, most of us, this is a slice of neural tissue at the electron microscopic level. That thing, if you just toggle that, that's a, that's a, a two-dimensional slice of a three-dimensional object, a synapse. Uh, on the top, uh, you see those round things, those are called vesicles. On the bottom, th that's the presynaptic, that's the axon. On the bottom is uh, the dendritic spine that's receiving that input. Uh, so that's, that's a cross-section of a synapse. Now, this is a, a cartoon of such a cross-section. These cartoons are never, never terribly uh, accurate, but the point here is all of those white spheres, those are vesicles, and those that are adjacent to the membrane at the bottom there and fusing, those are the ones that when they fuse, relay transmission. So the, uh, the, the long known, 50 years known, but really only in the early 90s, even in neuroscience, was really talked about again in neural computation, uh, is that that transmission is, is, when the axon fires, it doesn't mean that the synapse necessarily relays input. The transmission is, 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 is purely probabilistic, it's stochastic. So here you have these two vertical lines are the presynaptic axon firing, and the postsynaptic response in a voltage change, or actually a current change, is, um, is what you see here. And you see sometimes the axon fires, <clears throat> but there is no throughput, and then the next time there is. And this is, so this is a stochastic process. So there's a probability of transmission upon invasion of the axon. And what's really uh, remarkable is that probability changes with use. It changes on a very rapid time scale. This is a 40 hertz signal. These are the averaged postsynaptic effects of the thalamic cell here in that black dot going to this stellate cell in layer four. It's an excitatory cell that receives the initial thalamic input. <clears throat> and if you this is the average of, of 250 trials. The individual trials are stochastic. So this looks smooth and regular, but it's not. So this is the probability of transmission, called P in the literature, of the input from the thalamus to that regular spiking cell when the input frequency is a regular 40 hertz input frequency. If the input frequency was 80 hertz or 20 hertz, this fall off would be different because that fall off is a dynamic thing that's a function of input. And it can be well modeled. <coughs> well, the, the richness of the circuit becomes apparent when you look at the input to, of the same thalamic cell to the inner neuron counterpart in layer four, the fast spiking uh, inner neuron. Here is the average, you see how those postsynaptic uh, voltage changes are narrower, that's the nature of interneurons, is that they have rapid time constants, but you see also that the average EPSP, the average response, is really going down enormously. <clears throat> this is because the depression in not the weight, but the depression in the probability of transmission is more profound with the input to the interneuron than the input to the excitatory neuron. <clears throat> okay, well, so what is the implication for the circuit? Well, this is the world's simplest circuit. It's just the thalamic relay cell plus two cells in layer four. This is two out of 42 in, in the cortex. Uh, but what's, what's gonna happen here? Well, at 40 hertz, the initial input going into the stellate cell and the inner neuron may be comparable in weight, and they'll both be activated. Of course, it gets more complicated because they interact with each other, and those synapses are different, but just to start with these first two.
But after three or four spikes of continuing input, the input to the inner neuron dials down. The input to the excitatory cells dialing down, but not as fast. So as a result, the, the balance, the difference between the activation of the excitatory cell and the inhibitory cell shifts significantly during three or four inputs over a, what is that now, a uh, 75 millisecond period. And so then you get a shift in the throughput of the circuit because the inner neurons are no longer gating shut throughput through layer four because the input to them has dialed down more rapidly than input to the excitatory cells. Well, I don't have to, I don't have to prove to you that if you then iterate this conversation through all the different circuit elements of layer four and of the neocortical column, You've got a wickedly complex, beautifully complex, because all those synapses are stochastic and all of them have dynamic changes in probability that are, that, that are dependent on the type, the identity of the target. Well, that's, okay, too complicated. That no one understands how that system works. No one understands how that, that circuit works. I did my PhD thesis on exactly such a circuit. So whatever I learned is in there, but it's only one one millionth of the whole story. But that is exactly how biological circuitry is built. It evolved that way. It didn't have to evolve that way. It didn't have to be probabilistic transmission. Could have been 100% reliable. I'll tell you at the end of the talk one, one example for the purpose of this depression. <clears throat> how much more time have I got? Five minutes. Well, then I'm not going to tell you about homeostatic regulation, except just look up the papers of Graham Davis at UCSF. He's got 40 of the most beautiful papers on 25 different mechanisms of homeostatic regulation and their biophysical basis. Uh, and so, so there's, there's homeostasis of synaptic uh, uh, release, homeostasis of synaptic weight, meaning what do, what's homeostasis mean? It means that all these components adjust themselves so that the average level of activity is fixed. The average level of cell firing is fixed. And why? Because Sparse distributed computation is a more effective mode than either overactive or highly silent neural circuitry. So, so throughout the system is woven necessarily, obligatorily, is, is, is ubiquitous homeostatic mechanisms. The last thing I'll talk about is what I was alluding to with Christoph, which is how do you wire such systems? Neural circuits wire themselves. So, this is, uh, I'll just show a little bit of this movie since time is run, running out. This is a system with the bottom is a four layer retina, four different retinal ganglion cell types. Then layer four and layer two, three of the cortex. Each of these simulated cells has, of course, dendritic trees that integrate input in their dendrites in a nonlinear way. Each of these cells is connected with synapses that have different dynamic uh, change in probability of transmission. And what you do is you, you play this movie for one and a half million time steps. You could do it with simple geometric images here. It's easier to understand what the retina is doing with that. But we also used uh, uh, movies of objects floating around on, on background. And then if you integrate a, a set of rules for local modification of not just synaptic weight, in fact, turn off modification of synaptic weight and just have modification of synaptic stability, Gated by branch spiking, neuron spiking, axon input, uh, increase and decrease uh, of synaptic stability leading to synapses breaking, what, what do you get? What's the result? So this is the result of that simulation when you use natural movies. What I have here is a, is, is a, um, uh, this, the set of neurons in the retina connected to layer four cells after I don't know, I think this is 500,000 time steps of playing a movie to it. And so what you see here is, is the, not the receptive field. This is not the receptive field. This is the connected field. These are the cells that are connected. Of course, they lead to receptive fields that look perhaps something like V1 receptive fields. The different colors are the different branches of the stellate cells. Uh, the point is that uh, real neural circuitry wires itself, and uh, that's just as ubiquitous and just as central in neural computation as, as everything else that I mentioned. Okay, so let me, let me quickly just close by showing you uh, a sensory, sensory environment. I, I showed this, this is from actually my, my talk in last year's um, session. That's a convection field. This is an olfactory environment with four different olfactory sources. 
This is on the right here, if my mouse is working, you can see the uh, sensory activity. It's quite complex because we've got four different odorant sources and uh, the, the job of the animal is to determine which odorant is it close to, where's the banana, where's the poison. So the, the neural problem is to take this sensory information and uh, in the presence of an unknown background and determine what object it's near and does it want to eat it or does it want to move away from it. Canonical, simpler, not 42 cells, but seven different cell types in the piriform cortex. That's why I always argue that that should be added to the work program. If we then synthesize this piriform cortex circuit with these seven different cell types, uh, we want to predict this. This is, the, this is the actual odorant concentration of the four different odorants. On top is the prediction. You see that they match pretty well. This is the cross correlation. So that's the fitness metric. Okay, let me now, and I'll close by saying this. What is the function of that synaptic depression? We talked about how all these different synapses are not um, deterministic, but they're stochastic. Why are they stochastic? That short-term depression that means the probability goes down briefly, then comes right back up, that can only be implemented biophysically if a synapse is stochastic, or perhaps best implemented that way. We could debate that later. Well. This is comparing performance to a four-layer uh, convolutional net. Uh, the neural system performs better. In red is the performance of the neural system. In blue, is, in, 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 uh, blue in, in this dashed line is the performance of the, com the convolutional net. Now, if uh, uh, Google trained it, maybe it'd be a little better. Uh, but what happened here? Two things I just want to show you. The homeostatic set point, the how active do cells modify their excitability to get to uh, is a parameter in the system, and it evolved to 9 or 10 percent in these simulations to optimize performance. That's how active cells actually are in the piriform cortex when odorants are presented. But this last thing is regards the synaptic depression. This uh, black curve traces, we started, basically we started out the simulation this, and, and we evolved these parameters in the sense of artificial evolution with no synaptic depression in the feed forward synapses in one of those elements in the circuit. No synaptic depression. But every single time synaptic depression evolves. In other words, the parameters that control the synaptic depression turn on and, and it gets to a, you know, a uh, a, a high level of synaptic depression always in, in order to optimize the, the, the functioning of that circuitry. Um, why? Well, heuristically, it's because it's helpful to null background in order to recognize something. So, so the point is, just to close, the point is that you know, th these are the elements of uh, neural circuitry, that those five that I enumerated. Uh, branch neurons with nonlinear integration, with d dynamic synapses, homeostatic mechanisms throughout that wire themselves. Uh, all of that, um, none of that is really incorporated or studied very deeply with convolutional nets, even though those are extraordinarily powerful and will, will be very valuable. And if we really want to pursue neurally inspired computing, I just want to commend uh, some of us, uh, to, to, in a systematic, quantifiable way, to, um, to integrate and harness those sorts of neurally computing, neurally inspired elements that are in fact found in biological circuits, to build things that work, to build machines that, uh, that perform in sensory motor environments. You know, I hope that that's, I, I think that's one of the rationales for this conference, and I, I hope that we get some more with it. Thanks very much. Um, how, how the uh, homeostatic uh, target levels are set in the model uh, that you have shown? Could, would you say that again? I didn't how the homeostatic it. target levels are set in the, par in the, in the simulations that you have shown? Uh, are they preset as parameters or are they computed automatically? The, the homeostatic param uh, 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 parameters, meaning the level of activity that uh, the neuron adjusts itself to achieve, those are 
those are themselves metaparameters that are evolved in the, in the sense of artificial evolution. Those parameters are, were evolved in, in that example. So, so there is an, there is a, an adaptive rule that basically uh, update this target level? Uh, not, they... not an adaptive rule, but, but rather, uh, I could explain later what artificial evolution refers to, but it's, we, we, we ev evolve that metaparameter, how much activity is desired. We evolve that. Let me just get one from Thomas. Uh, I'll, I'll explain better. So maybe very quick. Yeah, yeah very, very quick one. Um, thank you for pointing out that uh, brains are not convolutional nets, but brain have, brains have evolved the way they are for different, you know, lots of different reasons. Uh, one of them is that they perform very well, and one of them is that they had certain hardware available that they can use. How do we decide which sure. ones which? Yeah, yeah. So I would say that that, that the fact that that synapses could be deterministic, but they're highly probabilistic, indicates that the probabilistic transmission is there in order to enable some computational function that is necessary. But but that always has to be asked: which is a physiological detail, and which is a computational necessity?